In this section, we're going to have a look at how we can reduce work by eliminating excise. And excise is basically work that we don't need to do, so we should just simply get rid of it. Aspects of this we have absolutely touched upon before. And just want to recap some of the important principles before we delve into offering some practical advice. So when we think about the types of work that our users engage in whilst they're using our applications, you can see four main categories that we can identify. Cognitive work is work where the user has to understand the behaviour, the organisational structures and the task-specific reasoning behind whatever they are doing. And if you think about this here, when, they, when users have to look at something and to work out, well, what is the behaviour of this? What is the structure of that? That, that it really should be unnecessary work from the user's point of view. We shouldn't force them to understand or to apply effort to understand our interfaces. Of course, depending on the task that they're doing, that may require task-specific reasoning. But we should try to help them as best we can to minimise, to limit that, to make it as effortless as it possibly can be. Memory work are things like recalling locations. Where did I store that file? Recalling the relationship or the behaviours between controls. What does that icon do? Um, and so on. And it can also include task-specific memory, where the user has to remember certain things about the task that they are doing. And again, if you think about this, we don't really want our user to have to be able to mem memorize things about, well, what does this control do? And if I do this first, where should I go there? We want to get rid of that. And likewise, for the task-specific memory, we want to make it as easy as possible for the user to locate, to retrieve those particular aspects, or not even to have a need to do so. Visual work is ones where we're not remembering things, but we're looking at something and then identifying is what control is related to this control, do these things go together? What is the layout of it? How do I navigate across these different structures? And again, obviously, we want that to be as effortless as it possibly can be. And then physical work are things like if you're using a pointer, moving the pointer around, if you're using gestures on a mobile device of implementing those gestures, key presses, clicks, anything that involves then that physical interaction with the device. And, and crudely, um, in terms of what is more cognitively demanding, cognitive followed by memory, followed by visual, followed by physical. And we should generally try to, to, to free up as much cognitive, then memory, then visual, then physical as we possibly can. Now, th there are other types. This is, this is only some of the stuff we called out here. Voice and auditory, where you have to listen to and understand information, or you speak as a means of control, and again, so on and so forth. We just want to explore these for four major categories. Now, this we've covered many, many times, but it's so important, we will iterate it one more time. And that is one of the most important usability goals is to get rid of unnecessary work to help the user achieve his or her goals as easily as possible. And, and we want to then identify excise, things that the user ideally wouldn't need to do or shouldn't need to do in terms of meeting their goals, and then to get rid of that. So how can we do that? A really, really useful way of doing that is to think about what our goal directed versus excise tasks. And it doesn't really matter what the user is doing. If you think about how the user does a process, you can break that up into a series of steps. And, and we as designers, that's something we should do. We should, whenever we have a sufficiently well-developed prototype, we should think about what are the steps that the user goes through when completing a particular task. And it's really important then when we're thinking about those steps that it's not just simply the physical steps that we do in terms of, oh, they will move the pointer and they'll click on this and they'll provide this particular type of gesture. But we go beyond that then to think about what are the other aspects? Oh, the user's going to have to find this control or the user's going to have to remember where this is located or the user's going to have to think about this. So we're not simply interested in identifying those specific interactions 
that would interact with an interface, we're interested in defining the steps that the user has to go through when they are performing that task, cognitive, memory, visual, and physical. Here's the thing, every single step that the user has to go through, it should be perceived by the user, and we'll come back to that, as bringing them closer to their goal. So if the user has to do something, the user should think, yeah, okay, I'm doing this because it helps me get to my goal. And the user-centeredness of this is the key bit. It doesn't matter from the developer's point of view, if the developer's going, well, I, I want to get the user's permission to do this. If from the user's perspective, they're going, does that help me get to my goal? No, then that is not something that the user would want to do and should be required to do. Even if the developer thinks, but, but I want to ask them this. So when we're thinking here about what is excise, what should we plan to get rid of, it really is things from the user's perspective. And we only want to, we want to make sure that everything that they do brings them closer to their goal. And that ties into the, the, the part then at the bottom, that quite often from a developer's point of view, we may present information to get the user to approve things or to do things, but that's based on the implementation model. And all of this, remember, we're interested in the user's mental model, their goals, and supporting explicitly those. Navigation exercise, this is something that, um, if, if you think about it, really is, in any navigational aspect is exercise. Something where the user has to go through a number of different screens or views to get to where they want to be. That is pure, uh, un unnecessary work. Ideally, the user shouldn't have to do any sort of navigation. It should just be immediately, ah, here's the screen, here's what I want to do. And the more navigation that the user has to go through, the, the more exercise and unnecessary work there is inside this. So as a takeaway, any sort of unnecessary or difficult navigation, get rid of the thing. And where you can detect this is if you have a situation where the user is having to, to navigate across multiple windows or from one view to another view to a third one, that's too much. That is, that you should be thinking about that and thinking, well, can we simplify this? Can we make it more compact? Can we get rid of some of those particular steps? Anytime you find the user has to open or click in this control and a certain then pop-up appears or extra window will then specify this and they then do that, that also is a more or less likely navigational exercise. We, we want to avoid anything that involves multiple steps to get to the one point then that from the user's point of view would be the, ah, this is what I want to do because this brings me closer to my overall goal. Now improved navigation, it will reduce memory, visual and physical workloads. There's less to memorize, there's less to look at and understand, there's less to physically do. That's all positive. One thing we must be careful about here is that um, we don't design things so that it makes it physically less clicks, but from a cognitive point of view, then puts greater demands upon the user. Or we, we say, okay, we'll save two mouse clicks, uh, yeah, but then the user's gonna have to remember to do this particular point, uh, this thing at this particular point in time. So always remember in terms of the order, cognitive, memory, visual, and, and physical. Stylistic exercise is another thing broadly we'll want to look at uh, getting out of the unnecessary elements. And stylistic exercise is, is, is anything that is visual work where we have to look at an interface and to think, what's important here? What, what are the things I can interact with? What are the things that give me useful information? And what's there just to visually look nice? And you can have interfaces that look nice, that do have visual characteristics, and that's fine as long as how the user can interact with it and the information the user is looking for is still very easily seen and, and presented through that interface. If we have an interface that is overly stylized, um, or maybe just a per layout or something like this, then okay, it may convey a certain physical characteristic or brand or mood to it, but if it gets in the way of, of, of what the user wants to do in terms of doing their task, doing it as effortlessly, as easily as possible, it's not worthwhile. We want to support our users' goals first and foremost. So some general advice then on things that we can do. 
don't force users to change their view to carry out a function that affects the current view. So if the users are doing something on, on a particular screen and you find that, okay, so they also want to do this, which is related to the, the screen that they're on, but it requires them to go to another screen and then to come back, that's an indication of something we should try to avoid. If it's to deal with this particular view, do everything on that particular view. If we are displaying new information, we don't want to force our users to, to resize windows or frames or things like that. Uh, and a good way of indicating this is where if, if, if something's always displayed and you find users always resize it every single time, that's an indication of unnecessary work. It really should be up to the application, even if it requires extra work, to put in a bit of thought, a bit of processing to work out, okay, what information do I want to display what information or how much space they have available, what's the user going to expect here, and how do I size things so that it's going to work for the user? And again, through user testing, you can evaluate all of these aspects. You can try different things out. You can then get to a situation where you think, yeah, this is going to work for the majority of users. Similar to that, um, don't force users then to move to reposition um, frames. But look, remember the user's preferences around this here. If the user constantly goes for a certain layout, then that should be the layout that we remember and use by default. So don't force users to remember where they store files or other type of information. That makes sense. Um, that, that should either be automatically displayed for them, or it's maybe something they shouldn't have to worry about at all. It's just then available for them. Don't for users to re-enter information. Uh, so that can be in terms of dialogues or for settings, where the user does have a default value that they've expressed before, then either stick with that or, or display it so the user can then sort of just nod and, and signify, yes, that's okay, that's the values they want. So again, all things we've covered before, but it's really important then that when we're thinking about our interfaces, these are the types of things that we, we look at. And then our final uh, slide here is don't force users to provide information just for the sake of completeness. And, and this quite often is completeness from the, the imp, from the programmers, from those of the implementation model. Let our users decide what information they want to provide. And quite often you may have forms where you have compulsory fields that must be filled in. Now, when you say must be filled in, um, from the user's point of view, the things that must be filled in, the user should understand and think, yeah, I understand why this is a must. Quite often, fields that are labeled as compulsory are really sort of ones that the, the developers think, well, it'd be nice to get this, so I'm gonna force the user to provide it. That might be okay from the developer's point of view, it's not okay from the user's point of view. So again, we really should only require the user to provide information that is absolutely necessary and then let them decide beyond that what additional information they wish to provide. Don't repeatedly require the user to provide their permission for actions, um, other than where the actually user wants to give their explicit permission. So we, we shouldn't constantly require the user to confirm, are you okay with this? Are you okay with that? What about this here? Um, unless it is something where the user has indicated, no, look, I want you to get my explicit permission before doing this. Um, most things, the users will just be happy for it to, to get on with and to do. So then, related to that, is don't ask users to confirm their actions other than where an action isn't reversible. So where we can't undo something, we don't really need, uh, sorry, only in the case where we can't undo something, that's the only situation that we need to ask the users, look, are, are you certain about this because I can't undo it? If we can undo it, we don't need to ask our users, are you sure about it? Because they have a way then of indicating afterwards if it wasn't what they intended. That brings us to the end of this section. In the next section, we're actually going to go on to look at undo and redo because it's such an important element. And other than simply enabling the user to, to, to go back and to undo something that they've changed their mind on, it is a number of important additional advantages as we'll see.